Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Birdland here in New York City. Saxophonist and also flautist Frank West is no stranger to the legacy of jazz. His 70 years in the business has proved that you do get better with time. Tonight he's playing with the legendary Kenny Barron on piano and his niche in jazz has really been with the plethora of artists that he's backed whether it's the legendary Count Basie Orchestra to Clark Terry to Josephine Baker he has really left a niche in the world of jazz the 2007 NEA Jazz Master inductee the six-time Downbeat Award Pole Critic Award winner for Flautist of the Year for six years in a row straight there's nothing that this man has not done and contribute to the world of music as well as jazz. You grew up in Oklahoma. Yeah. How did you get exposed to modern music and jazz music? Well, music wasn't as modern then as it is now. You understand? That was long ago, back in the 30s when I started. I started playing in 32. So uh, there wasn't much else to do but play music, you know. So who were some of the people that you idolized and influenced you to play the saxophone? Oh, well, uh, I had a school teacher, Ted Rice, who taught in the school where I went to school, uh, attended, and uh, he played saxophone. And he gigged at night, too, you know. So it happened that he just lived across, diagonally across the corner from me, and was nothing between my house and his house but the schoolyard, so I could always hear him playing, you know. I understand that when you moved from Oklahoma to Washington, D.C., your whole scope of music and just life in general changed. Oh, naturally, yeah. Well, there I ran into uh, people my age who were playing jazz, you know, like Billy Taylor and Justin Sumner and Billy White and oh, Pace, uh, a, lot, a lot of people, you know my age that were playing jazz then. So when I heard that, well, that's, when, that's what I wanted to do. And I, in fact, I had stopped playing for a year because I was playing that classical saxophone music and I got tired of that, you know. And I, when I heard, you know, kids my age playing jazz, and like, you know, at that time, 19, 35, <laughs> Billy Taylor was already working then, you know. He was about 15, you know, so. How did you develop your love and the passion for playing the flute? Oh, well, I'd always wanted to. I used to listen to Wayman Carver with Chick Webb's band. He's the first jazz flutist, you know. And uh, 
they had a little group in the band they called the Little Chicks, and he played with that. And he recorded a lot with Benny Carter, too, with Benny Carter's groups. So I was influenced by him. And then uh, my high school orchestra teacher gave me a flute to take home to see what I could do with it, you know. But at that time, I needed a teacher, so I knew I needed a teacher, so I just had to wait until I could get to that. Now, I understand that you didn't play or pick up the flute until many, many years later. Many years? What do you mean, many years? Well, you, you, you played the flute, but it wasn't until, I would say, after the war, after you played. Well, I, yeah. went, I, I went back to college after the war. I went back. Under the GI Bill, I went back to school, and I went to school that had uh, teachers from the National Symphony in Washington. So that's how I got a chance to play, learn the flute. I studied with Wallace Mann. He was with the National Symphony. You've had a fantastic career, and you've played with some of the most incredible band leaders of of your generation. One of them was with Mr. Billy Eckstein. Could you tell me what was it like working with Mr. B? Oh, that was fun. You know, that was a really the first bebop band. You know, and had all the, all the bebop scans with that band. Almost everybody that we revere, we talk about, and this music came out of that band. Well, C.B. liked the music, you know, <clears throat> and anybody you can think of, Fats Navarre, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, oh, Charlie Rouse, uh, oh, John Malachi, Tommy Parter, Sarah Vaughan, uh, anybody you can name, you know, all the uh, uh, Mad Lad, uh, Leo Parker, anybody you name in jazz had been in that band, Kenny Durham. Everybody, you know. How long were you in the group? A year. I was in the band until it broke up. In 19, 19, uh, when was that? 1946, I think. Early 47, 46 or 47. Then I went with Eddie Haywood. What was it like working with Billy? Oh, it's beautiful, you know, because we had all the blowers in there, you know, in the first bebop band, and that's when the... <clears throat> People stopped dancing so much they started listening because but when we play with B, he always had three fourths of the audience was women, you know, because they liked him. He was a good singer and looked good, you know, so we always had good crowds. You also played with the legendary Boo Moose Jackson, also, another oh, yeah. RB great. Tell me what was it like working with him? Oh, well, we did a lot of blues, you know, and things. He had a couple of hits. Uh, I love you, yes, I do, and bow-legged woman and all that. So we did three tours down south in one year. That's what made me quit the road. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, he's playing the big crowds, six, 7,000 people every night, you know. 
So, you know, we went down the first tour with, uh, uh, what's his name? Oh, I can't think. He had a, a hit uh, uh, Hucklebuck in 3530. Uh, 30. What was his name? Paul Williams, yeah, you know. So we did a lot of business, you know, but that was too much south for me. <laughs> Three times in one year, so I quit the road. That was, I quit the road in 1948. And I stayed home in Washington until I went with base in 53. I was off the road five years. <laughs> Count Basie courted you at a time when you just refused to go on the road. You were in D.C. and you were st settled. Yeah, well, I was in school. I didn't want to quit school to go back on the road, you know. I wanted to finish what I was doing, and I did. What was it that persuaded him to say, okay, I want you to join my band permanently now? Oh, he didn't say that. He called me up and... He said he wanted me to join the band, and I told him, well, well what, he, what really interested in me, if at first, he said, I think I can give you more exposure than you've had. So I thought about that, and I said, maybe that's what I need. So I told him I needed a salary. He said, what you want? I told him. He said, okay. So that was it. While you were with Count Basie, you were an arranger. You played alto, you played tenor, and you also played flute. What was it like working with Count? What were some of the things that he demanded, and what were some of the things that he requested of you as an arranger? We didn't demand anything. He just hired people that he knew knew what they were doing, and then he let them do it. He didn't, he didn't never rehearse to band even. He never bothered nobody. <clears throat> it's easy to work. All you got to do is do your job. He never, he never even rehearsed a man. He just listened. How was it? How was it like arranging for Count Basie? Oh well, he'd he'd, he'd say, "Hey, well, I want you to write me something. You know what I want? That ding a ding a ding a ding a ding a ding. That's it. That's all he tell you. Then you go, you go, you know what he wants. You know." <laughs> First time I actually played with Frank was actually with the Benny Carter Orchestra. We went to Japan, and I think it was the first time I played with Frank. We spent about three weeks together. So I mean, it was, he gave me a lot just in terms of learning about the history of the music. And sitting next to on the train, sitting next to him and Benny Carter was like a history lesson, you know, about what went on before and then how what the scene was like before, you know, during the during the 40s and the 50s, and you know. So I learned a lot just from that. And then playing with Frank, I mean, he's just, just a, a lot of spirit and a lot of fire and a great sense of humor. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Birdland here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank the legendary Frank West for his time as well as the staff here at Birdland. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Peace.